I come from a great American story, right? So I'm a great, great grandson of a slave, Amos Howard, who lived to be over 100 years old. So from the great, great grandson of slaves to the president of not one, but two universities. I was born in Mount Pleasant, Texas. My mom was eight months pregnant with me. My brother was a year old. When my mom saw my dad off to Vietnam to the war, he was a young lieutenant, got out in 1972, and then we ended up in Plano, Texas, north of Dallas. My parents' bar was not one necessarily of ambition or a level of achievement, it was about respect. It was about doing the best you could in everything all the time with no excuses so that you could be proud of the outcome no matter what it was. My relationship with my brother, Big Reg, he was and remains my hero. Most of my life as a kid, I was little Reggie. And I didn't mind it because I doted on my big brother. And being two African-American kids in a predominantly white area, if you're a good football player, you must be okay. Football taught me about teamwork, discipline leadership, dealing with adversity. It's an imperfect sport. It has all its challenges out there, and we know some of those have come into fruition today with health and safety. But in so many ways, sports in general, not just uh, football, have been uh, a great part of our meritocracy. I was a faculty member at the United States Air Force Academy from 1989 to 1992. Chris was a political science major, and so I became his academic advisor. He's a voracious reader and a deep student and thoughtful student and even at an early age, sort of a sense of social justice, of what's right in the world and how can you make what's wrong better. Captain Michelle Johnson, who had been a Rhodes Scholar and is a mentor of mine, told me that this Rhodes Scholarship thing is very unique. He told me that as, a, as an advisor, I really had truly badgered him even more than I realized I had to, to go ahead and compete for a Rhodes Scholarship, that that wasn't something he was comfortable with. I went there and I did a master's degree and a doctorate and worked in several political military positions in NATO and in the Pentagon and the State Department as a young lieutenant on the scholarship. And then from there, I went on to flight school. While I was in flight school, I had a plane crash. It was pretty phenomenal to gone through that and almost died and had just been engaged to the woman I'm married to. So I met Barbara Noble in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa before the election with Mandela. I walk into the room and there's this woman sitting on the couch and I looked at her and I thought to myself, I'm going to marry that woman. I was very impressed by her. She wasn't not very impressed by me. She thought I was a cheeky American. It was nice, but it definitely was not love at first sight from my end. I, I worked hard. I used all that education that I had at Oxford to, to, to woo her. I used to call Chris my walking dictionary. He's very knowledgeable, but it's not in a show-off way. So that really impressed me and won me over. And just some of the kind, thoughtful things he did. He teases me all the time. He took me out of South Africa, so he was obligated to give something back. And he started the Impact Young Lives Foundation. Everything in my life happens in parallel. So I was in graduate school while I was a lieutenant. When I was at business school, I was still in the Air Force Reserve and I started my foundation by then. Chris and I first met in the fall of 2001 when he was a student in my leadership and organizational behavior section. Chris had a lot to share and teach his fellow students about leadership because he'd had frontline leadership experience and he had a remarkable capacity to capture it conceptually and to convey it to others so that they could take away lessons from his experience. I very quickly was drawn to the case study methodology because I thought it was a kind of a, um, a microcosm of life. I'd actually seen the class card, so I was prepared to be impressed, but what really struck me was his friendly manner, and also the way he kind of leaned into every question. I did not move up with Chris his first year. He was on his own. He was Dr. Phil to a lot of his younger peers. And then the second year, I came up with a family, time management, a few of his friends, and they still teased me up until today. They said, well, when you came, everything changed. Having a family at Harvard Business School was absolutely terrific, because when all my single buddies wanted me to go out, I had an excuse. I, I can't go out, I'm married, I'm an old guy. This is when 9-11 happened, and there was this question of, was Chris, Chris going to be recalled? But a funny thing happened just before graduation, and that was I got called up. 
And that's what I remember about him, both in class and then the way that the real world was bearing down on us here on campus and his rising to that call of responsibility. So if I had to choose three words to characterize Chris, they would probably be uh, service, service, and service. I had been at the big state university, Oklahoma, as a vice president. I had been at the small liberal arts college, Hampton, Sydney. Robert Morris University is big enough to matter, yet small enough to care. It's sort of, for me, the Goldilocks. When I first saw Chris's resume, I thought it was a test from the search firm because it was too good to be true, right? When you look at the resume and you say, well, this, this, is, uh, this person doesn't exist, right? To the border. When he was officially introduced to the Robert Morris community, all I did was stand back and watch him move amongst the students and how easy he interacted with them and how they flocked to him. The expressions on their face to know that, you know, we picked the right person. Uh, that's kind of where we're operating and the way that we're... Higher education has been great because you need someone who's kind of a polyglot, who likes this, likes that. It's French literature, then it's football, and then it's donors, and then it's the theater. New England. New England. But that drives some people crazy and it really excites me and exhilarates me. They have fit into this community very well. Barbara also has become very involved. She sits on a several non-for-profit boards. I think that they're both enjoying their time and their life in the Pittsburgh area. Growing up, I've constantly asked the question, who do you look up to the most? Many of my peers would name famous athletes or renowned world leaders, but my answer was always the same, my father. Chris, you told our kids, you do not have to be Chris Howard. This is my resume. You have to write your own story and your own resume. I love you from the bottom of my heart.